So, uh, yeah, as Rob says, my name's Liam. I am chair of the RSS Merseyside Local Group. And we are a group based in Liverpool that puts on all kinds of different events about hot topics in data science. And we are for the whole spectrum of people interested in stats, from absolute beginners to complete experts. So our event today is going to be based around open data sources, because there's now a ton of these opportunities for anyone to access and use large open data sets for research and other projects. And we're going to hear about some fascinating examples of these today. Um, I'll talk, we'll, we'll hear some talks about open data as well in general. Uh, and then you'll also get a chance to be hands-on and try some of this for yourself in our practical afterwards. So we are going to start with uh, three short talks from our guest speakers that cover social media data, uh, environmental and public health data, as well as geographic data. Then we've got about um, half an hour for some time for some questions for any of our speakers in a panel discussion. Um, and then we'll have a refreshment break from about um, 11.35, maybe 11.40 until 12. And then at 12, we'll start our practical. Uh, this is, I think, in the PC teaching center, Rob? It depends on what people want. If everyone's got, or most people got laptops, so I've got a building on my <laughs> I caught him out there. It's quite Okay, cool. Um, before we start, just to mention for those interested in, it, I guess, more, more sort of technical statistical topics, we do have some more events with the RSS this year. So we've got an event on Bayesian real time modeling coming up in September with speakers from Newcastle and Lancaster. And we'll also have a talk about how you use stats in cybersecurity in December. Uh, you can find out more about us uh, as a local group on our website, which is rss.org.uk forward slash Merseyside. We're also on social media. We've got Facebook, Twitter, and we've got a YouTube channel where the recording of today's talks and panel discussion will go up afterwards. Uh, we've also got a fancy new newsletter, which I would encourage you to sign up to if you're interested in local data science events. And lastly, just to say, the Royal Statistical Society is not just for you know, hardcore statisticians. It's for anybody interested in data. And that includes um, students, postgraduate taught students, undergraduates. And if you are a student, you can actually get free e-membership through the RSS website. So this gets you access to training opportunities, events, and also networking with our young statisticians section. Um, I think that's probably enough kind of plug-in from me. So I'm going to pass over to our first speaker, who is Joseph Allen. So Joe's a uh, front-end developer at N Brown PLC. He's got a history of bouncing around various web and data roles, including the UK Data Service, where he trained researchers, students, and governments to use some of those amazing data resources we have out there. So if uh, you're OK to plug in, I will pass you the mic. Right, can everyone see that? Bigger, smaller? All good? It's going to be very big then. OK, um, I guess before I get into it, I, I'll send the, this notebook to Liam later just so you can see all this. I have made tiny URLs, so if anyone is desperate to look at any of this stuff, now you can. Um, so this notebook is available here, tiny URL, UKDS Twitter demo. Um, there is an interactive binder link. So if you want to run the code and you don't have anything that runs the notebook, that'll let it run in your browser. So you can play it on your phone if you really want to follow along. Um, this will be sort of a 20 minute code demo um, that is extracted from a 90 minute, two hour talk that I've done that's available there. Um, and the data source is also in the same repository. Uh, it uses something called Twark, which I've again spent many hours talking about over the last year. That's the way I recommend collecting Twitter data. And since most of you are probably academics, you do actually have access to the academic tier. So for free, you can scrape like 10 million tweets from any time in the last sort of 15 years. Um, so that's the recommendation now. It changes all the time because they've not really figured out archive search for Twitter yet. 
Um, but that's the good stuff. Um, introduction. Thanks, Liam. That was pretty good. I don't think I can do much better than that. But I'm Jace Fallon. Um, if you follow me on Twitter at JaceFallon1234, that's probably the best way to ask me any questions. If you want to follow me there and message me in six months and ask how I actually did some of this stuff, that's totally fine. That's, I get that all the time, and I haven't worked for the uni for six months or so. Um, so you won't be the first. As said, these resources were developed with the UK Data Service, so I have to mention them here. Um, it's all open, it's all free for anyone to use, so hopefully they don't mind me doing that today. Um, but as I say, I have moved on, so I work for M. Brown now, big fashion company. They own JD Williams, Giacomo, Home Essentials, that kind of stuff. So if you are looking for a job, we hire data people quite a lot. We hire front-end developers, which is what I do. Um, but that makes it count as work, so they should be happy now. Um, and disclaimer, obviously we're grabbing some tweets here from the internet, so sometimes people have quite rude names, sometimes people say quite rude things, so I might have to say some stuff, but it's not, not what I think on these issues, basically. Um, okay, so in another notebook, I've basically scraped 7,000 tweets from the period of October 2021 to January 2022, all located in the UK, so that's something we can do with the Twitter archive search, we can filter by the location. Um, and they were scraped on the 16th of February 2022. I say all that because in that time period, someone might have deleted those tweets, so they might not be publicly available anymore. So that's sort of my reproducibility stamp, though you couldn't reproduce it if they were scraped and deleted and now available. But that, again, it's all in the one-hour talk. I talk about this stuff quite a lot. Um, I search for the keywords cough, coughing, sneeze, sneezing, fatigue, and headache otherwise regarded as some of the common COVID-19 symptoms at the time. Again, it's changed quite a lot, it seems. Um, in this next sort of 18 minutes, I suppose, we're going to cover just how I would initially explore some data from Twitter Archive, uh, visualize the increase in these terms over time, investigating connected sim symptoms with some natural language processing, and just for fun, build a really quick word cloud um, so that we can actually tweet something at the end of this. So if you're running this in Binder, you'll have to install these packages, but I'm not running it in Binder, so I don't have to. So import all the packages we need. We've got pandas, that's our data manipulation library, lets us merge data sets, import CSVs, that kind of stuff. NumPy lets us do some sort of array manipulation things, but we won't be dealing with any of that today. We just need it. Matplotlib is just our plotting library, and then Seaborn is our much nicer plotting library that lets us get some nicer colors, nicer plots, stuff like that. You can ignore all this, that's just how I make those graphs really big. Um, these are how I make it look like it's UK Data Service branded colors, a nice, a nice snippet if you want to steal it. Um, and in case that scraping that I would have done earlier didn't work, the data set that I'm using is also available in this GitHub repo. So if you can't get access, you can play with these seven months anyway. Okay, so let's start reading stuff in. Oh no, I didn't run it. <laughs> that scared the heck out of me. <laughs> right, so I always run data head just to inspect the first sort of five rows. It's looking like there's just a load of stuff that doesn't really mean anything right now, but we've got the IDs of the tweet. Um, so something cool we can do with these is go to any tweet that already exists. So here's a tweet I did ages ago about this exact talk. And if you can see in the URL, it might be too small up on that big screen, but there's a big number there. So that's your tweet ID. And if you paste that tweet ID there, then Twitter will redirect us to the correct tweet, even though it said it was my status. So we can see here, many things make me sneeze, some natural, apparently it's one of the new symptoms, that's me doomed. So it sounds like we've got some content about COVID, thankfully, in our first tweet. Um, also has the word sneeze, which is good because that's what I was searching for. Um, so that's a way to sort of visually inspect these if you're not too sure. We've, we've got about 80 columns here, so it's, it's not really trivial to inspect them. We can see some scientific notation is being forced in there because those tweet IDs are so big. Um, so it's a bit useless at this point, but that's how we can sort of interrogate it ourselves. Um, we also have a user who is called, I think, Mark Coughling. And this is one of the things I talk about quite a lot, is that it feels quite like a breach of privacy to just talk about this, this man, um, and he doesn't know that he's in my talk. Um, and ironically, the, it does have the word cough in it as well. But this is another quirk, is that if you search for a word like vegan, you can find a lot of tweets from users that are called, you know, like vegan James. Um, but the actual content of the tweet won't contain the word veganism, so the search is a little bit more, more strange than that, sadly. Um, but you could just filter out those users that have those things, but 
again, you might want vegan James. You might be a, a big vegan influencer when you're looking for search words. So it's it's not sort of an easy thing to do getting these archive tweets. Sadly, it's it's a bit of a mess. I, I try and reject all like reply threads and stuff like that, and just try and get tweets on their own usually. Okay, so we can look at just those first five tweets. So I sneeze a lot in general, sometimes for no apparent reason. Is sneezing the difference? Don't remember that being listed as a symptom for COVID. Not that I believe anything they're saying about it. Again, not my opinions. Um, a week, FFS, I had the shivers bad yesterday evening, cold one minute, hot the next, bad fatigue, weakness, stiff muscles, it's been loads of fun. So there, we have the keyword fatigue, but we're starting to see some other stuff. Shivers, weakness, stiff muscles, potentially other symptoms of COVID that aren't necessarily being reported in the mainstream, but seem to correlate with these symptoms that we're seeing. Um, definitely over 40, had all those side effects since yesterday morning, working from home, didn't have the strength to lift my arms, arguably that's fatigue. Joints aching, again, another symptom. Full body shivers, which we've seen literally in the tweet before, and a horrific headache. And she's reckoned she's coming to the end of it, she's been coughing for a few days, I've done a test, it was negative, never say never, ha <laughs> ha. Um, so I always recommend running the info function just to see what we've got. This is probably the best place to look at all those columns we've got. We can see we've got geolocation data, information about the author. I believe we can even get in here if it's a sensitive tweet, which will sort of give you a filter if you do want to get rid of anything political, racist, sexist, homophobic, all that good stuff that Twitter sadly shows us um, en masse. Um, I also always run describe, though in this Twitter data it's not that useful because there's not enough mathematical information really. Um, but here we can see, you know, the mean number of followers each of these tweets about COVID symptoms has, the mean number of likes it has, which is six, but as we can see, heavily weighted by the person who got almost 9,000 likes on one tweet. Um, and the highest retweets, similar pattern, those three lower quartiles have no retweets at all, but somebody is getting 300 retweets for something, which we'll see later. Um, at this point, I've realized that's too many columns. We can't really do anything reasonable with these 80 columns at the time. We don't have a research question. I'm just sort of have exploring this data and trying to have a bit of fun. So I'm going to reduce it down to just the tweet ID, when the tweet was created, the text that makes up that tweet, author ID, when it was created, the username, the location, how many followers they have, the full name of where they are, and the like and retweet count. So that's pretty much everything you need to sort of analyze the text, but you could do geographic distribution of those tweets. You could see, you know, the impact of somebody's tweeting and whether other people engage with it. So that's quite a nice start point. And now at least I can actually inspect the head and actually get some meaning out of it. So I've got the start of the text. I can see that word sneeze, sneeze. It's all looking good, sneezing. I've got the IDs if I want to inspect them. I've got the usernames if for whatever reason I find a COVID influencer, I could track them down through their sort of representation in this column. Um, I also get the location. I'm not going to go into it too much, but location sucks on Twitter. It's so hard to get actual, like, reputable location sources. You can search for near London, for example, but would you expect there are people who live in London, the tweets coming from London, the people who are from London? So you, you kind of get a mix of these. It, it's not very nice, um, and it's really hard to verify as well because you can't just go check all those. Well, you can check all the geotags that they have, but also most people don't tag their tweets. About 2% of people still have geotagging enabled on tweets. So that introduces a huge bias in Twitter data sets anyway. Okay, next up, have COVID symptoms grown? So I have included the sort of official COVID data um, so that we can visualize it over this. So we've got, I mean, it's dated now, but a couple of months ago, this is what the COVID cases were looking like, smooth and unsmoothed. And hopefully, well, I don't know if I should use hopefully, um, but we would think that coughs and coughing related tweets would probably rise with rise and fall with this. Um, and that's what I've got here. So these are the number of tweets containing all those COVID symptoms. I might just take one zoom out. Oh, that's probably too small. That'll do. So we can see some overlap, you know, there's a slight surge at the start, a slight surge at the start, a very exaggerated surge when everybody was complaining about COVID and unsurprisingly, that's when everyone had COVID. So it kind of makes sense. Um, a little bit weird though, you know, why is it so enhanced and quite a small sample size. We've only got about hundred tweets a day from the UK here. So it's, it's not really enough to correlate them 
Um, and there's also the question of, you know, is it actually a correlation or does more people having COVID just make more people paranoid enough to signal on Twitter that they might have COVID and that you should be concerned about them? Doesn't really tell us that, sadly, um, but that's, that's a hunch. Um, so this little snippet here will just reduce the words cough and coughing to has cough as a Boolean that we can visualize. Same for sneeze and sneezing, just to roll them together and fatigue and headache. Um, and then we can see here which one sort of shows up the most. And most of those tweets contain coughing. It's a bit of a sort of bit misdirectional because obviously we search for these key terms. So there's not really much to find from these, but it just shows sort of how many people are talking about fatigue, how many people are talking about coughing out of those 7,000. Um, I can log out some tweets about coughing just to confirm that. I'll just do one. I've had a cough for four weeks, went to take a PCR where I live, came back negative. Has sneeze. I sneeze a lot in general, sometimes for no apparent reason. Arguably has nothing to do with COVID, um, but we don't have that context from the tweet. Uh, for fatigue, it's been terrible, mate. Fever, shaking, fatigue, swelling under the armpit, heart pounding was quite scary at one point, mate. Starting to feel a bit better now. So again, loads of symptoms I wasn't even looking for, but these are coming up really reliably. Um, and Last of all, headache, pressure headache. I suffer from pressure headaches for ages. Got to the point where I was waking up with a headache, going to sleep with a headache, got really depressed, tried an over-the-counter Sudafed tablets from my chemist, took a day or so, but it worked. Again, no idea if it's got anything to do with COVID, but we might be seeing more headache cases with the COVID numbers. So it's a correlation versus causation, sadly, at this point. So here's just a quick plot of those. So that's the coughing plot we saw before. So a little bump, a little dip, big bump over Christmas. Sneezing, we see not really anything worth accounting for, but we do see a slight surge in sneezing at that first bump, but not really at the peak. So I don't really know what that is. Maybe people had colds at the same time. Maybe sneezing isn't a symptom. Um, and then continues here, fatigue just seems to just constantly exists, just people are constantly complaining about fatigue, but it doesn't seem to surge with COVID cases. Um, again, tiny sample size, we're looking at 10 tweets a day, um, but that does maybe suggest, you know, is there a long-term fatigue thing happening that's unrelated to people who have COVID right now? Um, and then mentions of headache also, interestingly, spikes with that first spike, spikes with the Christmas spike. So maybe coughing lots just gives you a headache, maybe COVID gives you a headache, I don't really know. Um, but yeah, lots in there. So we've talked quite a bit already about those sort of missing symptoms. You know, we've seen shaking, fever, swelling, heart pounding, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it'd be nice if there was a way to sort of quickly and easily get these out. So my attempt at this is using some natural language processing. So I've got this NLTK package that has loads of cool stuff, sentiment analysis, all the, all the good stuff really. Um, and in there, I'm just reducing the text to the individual words so that I can get a frequency count of all the words. Now that doesn't start out very useful. Um, most commonly used word is just the full stop. Uh, we've got an at sign, obviously use loads in Twitter for tagging other people, uh, emails, whatever else. We have the word or letter A, commas, and then what we call stop words. So the and to words that don't really have any sort of bearing on the meaning of the actual sentence. And then at the bottom we have cough, which makes sense because we search for cough. So I don't know if we can really count that as a result. Um, luckily, we can filter out those uh, punctuation with just this little snippet here. So I'm just sort of building up a big snippet that might actually be useful at the end. So now punctuation should be gone. Um, it's not much better. We, the only sort of true results we have there are cough and headache, but we asked for cough and headaches. So obviously, they're going to show up in some prevalence. Um, next, we should get rid of the stop words. So as we've said here, at, either, and, they're great words. They show up all the time. We need them, um, but they're not much use in the world of COVID stuff. So again, NLTK has a library of stop words that we can use. You can print out here just all these words that we use all the time, but they don't really add any context to a sentence. So same again, remove punctuation, remove all of those stop words. Now we're getting somewhere. So we've got cough, headache, HTTPS, which is an internet protocol every time someone sends a link, annoyingly. The AMP is short for ampersand. So every time someone uses an emoji on Twitter, it'll start with an ampersand and then a code afterwards. So you, we can't get those emojis now, or we could, but we'd have to process them as something other than strings. Um, so that's why those are so high up there. Then we've got like, fatigue, got, cold, and get. 
Um, so cold is an interesting one because we've not seen a mention of cold before. It is Christmas time, so maybe people are just saying it's cold outside, um, but we'd have to dig deeper to find that. But it does look like that shows up quite a lot. Um, what have I done here? Yes. Um, so something I've not caught yet is that the word cough and cough with a capital C would currently count as different words. So I've just lowercased everything. And we can see that just for coughing alone, that does increase by about sort of 200, 300. So 10% of all of our cases had a capitalized C in, in cough. So it's, it's important that we do this just for accuracy. Um, and now with doing that, we do see, I think, coughing. Oh, no, it's all there. It's all about the same. There's just sort of like 10% more of the tweets that were missed just because they were the start of a sentence. Um, and finally, we're also underreporting things that are basically conjugations of the same stem. So I know I'm getting really deep into natural language processing here, but cough and coughing are arguably the same word. Um, so maybe we're underreporting coughs by splitting them. And it's fine here because cough and coughing have made our top 10. Uh, but what about sneeze and sneezing? Sneeze hasn't even shown up in the top 10. What about fatigue and fatigued? Uh, I can't conjugate cold in a way that makes sense right now, but yeah, and a more useful example would be like swim, swamming, swamming, swam and swimming. All different words, but all really referring to the same action. And if that's what we're looking for in our tweets, we're going to dilute it if we don't sort of merge them all together. Um, there we have cough, coughed, coughing, coughs. There's loads, loads of words like this. Again, NLTK, NLTK has a stemmer built in that does this for us. And I've already written this little snippet here that can do that for you if you're not sure what that is. Um, and that will reduce all those words to their stems. Sometimes that can be a bit weird. So fatigue, for example, becomes fatigue, I guess, because some conjugation doesn't use the E character. So you get some weird words, but when, you, when you're looking for these symptoms, you kind of know what you're looking for. So now we've got cough and headache at the top. Again, we've lost the E. Um, HTTP is still there. We'll remove that in a second. Uh, but we've got COVID now. We didn't have COVID before in our top 10. I, I don't know why. Um, Fatigue, SNES for sneezing, cold. We've got sore down in the top 20, throat, back, maybe sore throat, maybe sore back. They seem to have quite similar numbers. So I'd imagine sore throat is probably occurring together um, with a few cases just saying, oh, I'm just feeling a bit sore. Um, what else have we got? Lots of people sort of saying they're feeling good, better, thanking people. So again, maybe virtue signaling that you have COVID to get some attention. I'm not really sure, but uh, that's a different research project. And then pain as well. So a couple of negative symptoms that are occurring in the top 50 there, that now that we've sort of hidden all the punctuation, lowercase stuff, tidied it up a bit, are sort of falling out quite, quite naturally, I'd say. Um, as I said, HTTP and AMP are in there, so you can just remove them. Um, I can also, why did I? Oh, yes, OK. So I've done a plot just to see those sort of visual, um, how many of them there are, the frequencies. And obviously, cough and headache are just extremely overrepresented because I search for cough and headache. So I'll just drop those just so we can see the rest of them a bit more clearly. Um, yeah, so I mean, the fact that COVID even shows up when we weren't searching for COVID is quite interesting in itself. People assume these symptoms are COVID related or they are preaching that they have COVID and trying to showcase the symptoms. Um, as I said before, sore and throat are occurring almost exactly together. You know, there's 10 cases where they don't occur together. That might be an interesting symptom to extract. Um, we didn't find anything about shivering or anything like that. Maybe they're a bit rarer, but yeah, you'd have to do something a bit more clever to actually extract the medical symptoms from this list. But we've got them for all words now. Um, and then finally, I just do word cloud just because word clouds are fun. So there's a little function here that will convert a data frame of words and frequencies into the form that the word cloud package is expecting. And there we go. We've got a word cloud now. If you didn't like the bar plot, here's some true data visualization uh, now. So enjoy the get, day, feel, and other smaller words that don't mean anything. Um, not very good, though. I can't tweet that out at the end of the talk. People will be like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but I can change it, make it look a bit better, change the fonts, change the colors. Still not really very good. Um, this is where you add in the mask. And now, oh, now it looks like a virus. So that's something that I can actually tweet. And everyone's going to love that tweet, even though it's got the same stuff in it. Um, and then very quickly, just to wrap up, we'll find that most liked tweet um, and see 
who is skewing all our stats with their tweet. Oh no, it's deleted. Oh no, it's good, it's good. Someone in my group chat just said the only variant I'll be getting this weekend is the drinking beer variant. Main symptoms are drinking beer, then headache the next day. Lol, quality. 8,000 likes. Do you know how many likes my COVID picture got? The word cloud? Zero. Nobody likes that stuff. I wish I did this tweet. Um, anyway, but yeah, that's what's skewing all our data. That's the most important tweet in our data set if we were doing network analysis. That's what you guys might all get to look at very shortly. Uh, so enjoy, and I believe that's everything. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, did you say this notebook is available? Somewhere? Yes, it's all. I can send it to you afterwards if you want to tease yeah, it out. If, it's on the UK data service. Cool. Yeah, if you could, that would be great because maybe a few people might actually want to have a look yeah. at that during the practical session. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I won't be that. I can't stick around for the panel, sadly. So if you've got any questions, tweet them at me or send them to me and I'll write them all down. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks. Let's thank Joe once again. So our next speaker is Dr. Josh Longbottom. Hold on while I pull up the bio. So Josh is a postdoctoral researcher at the University, uh, sorry, at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, so his work involves predicting mosquito distribution and abundance in Tanzania to inform models of Rift Valley fever virus risk. And during his PhD in epidemiology, he focused on geostatistical models towards eliminating Human African trypanosomiasis. You can tell I used to be an infectious disease biologist. I'm going to pass it over to Josh. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Originally, my PI, uh, Dr. Jennifer Lord, was invited to talk, but unfortunately, she's busy today. So I've been, well, I'm taking the place, basically. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be more hands off than Joseph's talk. Um, but it's kind of complementary. It can be uh, a description of what we can do when we've got this data or some geological, uh, geographical data. Um, so my talk's just going to go through a, cu a couple of brief uh, slides on each of these things. So something I've termed the open pipeline. Um, I'll let you know what vector-borne diseases are so that you've got a bit of context for the rest of the talk. Um, I'll introduce some very brief ecological concepts, again, which will inform the data that goes into some of the models. Um, talk through the modeling process very briefly, and then talk about where you can get some of this open data from. So with regards to modeling um, infectious diseases, especially vector-borne ones, um, I kind of split this pipeline into data model and process and then kind of outputs and output dissemination um, so for vector bar models we want some data on the vector itself the disease um, and then um, what what term covariate so um, variables which might explain the distribution of these factors then all this data is going to go into a geospatial model um, which again is going to be constructed in open source software. Um, I'm an R user, not a Python user. Um, I know that's probably blasphemy to say here, but the whole process can be implemented in a range of different software. Um, again, this is more kind of an overview of the process and the methods, not necessarily the implementation. Um, and then once you've got a model with outputs from open source data, um, you know, you can make your code reproducible online, available online, and publish the results in open access journals. So what is a vector in the context of vector-borne diseases? Um, so it's a living organism that transmits an infectious agent. Um, so that could be a parasite, a virus, um, bacteria, from an animal or a human um, to another animal or human. So some examples here would be kind of mosquitoes, ticks, flies. Um, and then a couple of example diseases. So the first one here, you've got a tetsy fly in the top, and then a trypanosome. Um, and this is the vector and the, the parasite for a disease called sleeping sickness, or human African trypanosomiasis. Then you've got mosquito vectors, which kind of can transmit, you know, kind of parasites, viruses, um, worms, 
Um, the, the example here I've got is um, an Aedes mosquito and Rift Valley fever virus. Then we've got a sunfly here, which is transmitting um, leishmaniasis, and then ticks um, with the bacteria and um, Lyme disease. So one of the key concepts behind the type of models that I'm going to discuss today um, is an environmental niche. So this is kind of the specific area where an organism can be found or an organism inhabits. And this is due to relationship with environmental variables. Um, so if we take, for example, a virus, the presence of a host might be a limiting factor as to where the virus can occur, um, or a vector might be a limiting factor if it requires a vector for its, um, its distribution. Some might be airborne, for example, like COVID. Um, something like temperature might affect the, the distribution and suitability of a virus. Likewise with mosquitoes, you know, they might need a food source, so that could be an animal or a plant. Um, vegetation for shelter, factors such as temperature and precipitation, again, can limit the distribution. And then some of these vector-borne diseases have what's called a primary host. So this is where the, the parasite or, or virus might um, naturally live on and reside. Um, and then, you know, kind of transmission to humans is mostly secondary. Um, and if that's the case, then humans are a dead-end host. So the virus might not replicate sufficiently to transmit to other humans within, within a human. So as I mentioned, all of these um, habitats or niches can be represented spatially. And in the context of vector-borne diseases, we're interested in areas of overlap. So you might have areas where both the mosquito and the, the um, primary host coexist, but if there's no virus there, then it's not a risk of disease transmission. Like there is where, you know, kind of humans and livestock exist, but if there's no mosquito and no virus, then it's not an area of concern. So areas where all four of these overlap is where we would expect to see transmission risk. And areas where kind of three of these four factors coexist would be priority areas for surveillance, you know, in the, in the instance of an emerging infection. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the models and the data that goes into the models. Um, and that will set us up nicely for the, the discussion about open data. Um, so most of these, um, these niches can be explained by using environmental data and environmental variables, factors such as vegetation, um, land surface temperature, precipitation, elevation. Um, and these variables can be extracted from remotely sensed data. Um, so what, what, what this term means is there's satellites in orbit which are sensing, so absorbing information, in this case, light reflection from the Earth's surface remotely. Um, and they do this through different sensors. Um, and the sensors on the satellites can um, capture light at different wavelengths. But the most common bands or most common wavelengths of light which are captured on satellites are the red, green, blue, and near-infrared bands. Um, and these bands can be combined to represent true characteristics of the Earth's surface or can be used to generate additional metrics which are useful for um, inclusion in an infectious disease model. So the type of sensor on the satellite affects both the, the wavelength of light that it can absorb and the spatial resolution that they can absorb data at. Um, so basically, if we were to split this room into five meter by five meter good cells, our sensor might only be able to capture a summary of the light reflected from one of those cells. And that will give me you know, a reflectance value in the red, green, blue spectrum. And then this data can be represented on a grid. And that's how it appears here in these, in these images. Basically, each pixel is a different combination of red, green, blue, and then for red values. So this remote sense data can then be used to provide information regarding the environmental conditions at the sites in which we observe an infection. Um, so if we have, you know, kind of geographic data on where disease has occurred, 
we can kind of combine that with some remotely sensed data. Um, so, for example, elevation, land surface temperature, distance to rivers, vegetation, and then extract that data into our, our data set. So that will give us um, basically a data frame, which would include the, each of the sites, which might have an um, geographic ID, and then each of the environmental covariates observed at that location. And then we use that within the geospatial model to look at correlations between occurrence sites and potential um, locations of infection. So I'm just going to very briefly talk about one type of model that we use. Um, so these are species distribution models. And they're numerical tools which look at correlations um, within data. Um, they, they don't look at kind of spatial correlation in, the, in that sense, um, you know, kind of looking at spatial random fields, for example. These are purely looking at the environmental data at a whole, as a whole without that geographic attribute and looking at correlations. So, you know, if the temperature was 32 degrees in one site, what other sites are of the same temperature? Is that, are those potential um, locations which might be suitable for, for disease transmission, for example? So the most common um, species distribution model that I use within my work is a model called boosted regression tree. Um, so these are a machine learning tool, um, commonly applied for species distribution model modeling. Um, and they, they aim to classify the environmental data that's gone into the model and produce a probability of suitability, um, which ranges from zero to one. And as I mentioned before, they operate in environmental space. So it doesn't matter how close these disease occurrence sites are, it's more about the underlying ecological data that's gone into the model. So there are geographic models which look at spatial um, fields and spatial correlation, and this one is, you know, explicit of that, it doesn't, it doesn't factor that in. So yeah, these are informed by presence and absence data, so I might have environmental co covariates from presence locations, so sites where we've observed the disease and then other um, covariates from sites where we know that the disease isn't present, so we might have tested um, and found that there's no infection at that specific location. And yet these can be implemented within R, and I presume also within Python. Um, so this particular algorithm, um, modeling approach combines two algorithms. You've got regression or classification trees, um, where you, you, know, you kind of start with one characteristic and split at different nodes and different values based on others. And then boosting, which is just basically running a lot of simple classification trees and combining them to produce um, a metric of agreement across all your, your different submodels. So I've talked a lot about the covariates of the environmental data that goes into the model. Um, and kind of the suitability for this, this talk and this group is, is that quite a lot of this data is open. Um, and as I mentioned before, it can be obtained from satellites and remotely sensed. Um, so the most efficient way of obtaining some of this satellite imagery is through Google Earth Engine, um, which is free to access, so it's open source. And they do have commercial packages where you can do more processing and you know, kind of have prior priority on, on some of the, um, the servers that they use. But generally, it's open source. It interacts with a range of different satellite products. So there's hundreds of commercial and non-commercial satellites orbiting the Earth at the moment, each collecting remotely sensed data. Most of these are commissioned by governmental agencies. And as it's publicly funded, that data is made publicly available. Um, and Google Earth Engine just provides basically an interface for sourcing all of these different types of data. And then any processing that you do is done on the cloud, and so it's not done on your machine. There's no need to download the data beforehand in its raw form. It's computationally fast. And all the functions and help files are well documented. Um, so I interact with Google Earth Engine using um, their web platform, but they also have a Python package that you can install. Um, 
So yeah, they kind of amalgamate different sources of satellite imagery. Um, so, you know, there's, there's one called Landsat here, which is quite a common um, source of imagery. Sentinel, um, MODIS, which was a NASA program. Um, and different, there's different benefits of choosing different satellite imagery sources. So one is that spatial resolution that the data is collected at, so the gridded cells. If I wanted higher accuracy in my disease predictions, I, want, I might want to use covariates which are at a higher spatial resolution. But there's also something called the temporal resolution, so how frequently the satellite orbits the Earth. Um, some of these satellites orbit daily, so I can have disease, um, environmental data which correlates directly with my occurrence data or some of them could be you know, weekly or monthly. So I'm just going to show briefly um, the online platform for Google Earth. Oh. And an example script that I've got here. Um, as I say, it's not going to be as hands-on as Joseph's talk, but oh, and you can't even see it. Sorry, one second. Okay, here we go. I'll just try and make this a little bit bigger. So this is the Google Earth Engine Online platform. You have a section on the left where you store all your scripts and um, documents. This is basically all the, the help information, so the different types of functions that you can use within Google Earth. Um, you know, kind of you can query those within this document section. And then assets. This is any spatial data types that you've uploaded to Google Earth Engine to use within your processing. So what I'm going to demonstrate today is just how easy it is to obtain some remotely sensed data through Google Earth Engine. Um, as I mentioned before, this is all processed remotely on the cloud, so it doesn't use any of my bandwidth and doesn't use any of my um, memory or processing on my machine. So here I'm going to just download some satellite imagery um, for the whole globe between the time periods of um, January 2019 and December. 2019. So here I just specify start and end date. And then I can specify my area of interest, so where I want to get the data for, using either bounding box, so rectangle with you know kind of coordinates for each of the four corners, or I can upload a shape file to the site, which is basically a polygon of the area of interest. And then using this function, which is EE dot image collection, I can specify which satellite I want to grab the data for. Um, so there's a range of different satellite data within their catalogs, within their online repository. And say I wanted to grab data on vegetation, I would just search here and it would list all the data sets which are publicly available and detailing you know, kind of vegetation. Um, references here to MODIS, we'll have some for Landsat again. Um, but in this particular example, I'm going to use the, um, the MODIS satellite to get some on surface temperature data. So I just click on the data that I'm interested in, um, and it will provide here the particular reference ID that I will need within my, my script. I'm going to filter it to just contain the imagery between my start and end dates, and then to select the particular band um, that I'm interested in here, which is the daytime temperature. I'm going to do the same again for vegetation. So this is a normalized difference vegetation index. Again, I've just copied in the, the correct ID for that particular satellite um, and the band that I'm interested in, which is NDVI. And then there's different metrics of kind of combining the data across the time period that I'm interested in. Um, so the MODIS data, I believe, is collected every 16 days. So I have quite a lot of different scenes. And if I wanted to generate one static surface across the year, 
um, I could just generate a mean, for example, or a median. Um, Milan surface temperature data is in Fahrenheit, so this is just a, a little bit of code to convert to Celsius. And again, I'm then generating a mean across all the, the time periods. And then I'm going to plot the data um, so we can see it below. Um, so I'll just run this script and it will just show you how quickly Google can process this data. Um, it says. Okay, cool. So that's taken maybe 30 seconds to consolidate a year's worth of spatial data for the whole globe. Um, oh, and it's done it twice because I clicked run twice. So here I can visualize my data within the, the platform itself. So the top surface is the land surface temperature, red are hotter areas, blue are colder. I can query this data um, visually at this point. Um, and then also within my code, I've specified to create an object to export to Google Drive. And then those tasks just appear here. Um, and then if I was to click run, it would generate a file which would save directly to my, my Google Drive. So that's one way of um, obtaining this, this remotely sensed data. Um, you could interact with each of these data sources separately, pre-download all the raw data files, do your own processing. Um, but you could just imagine how much data that is um, and how much space and time that takes. So that is just kind of a brief overview of how I might get some of the environmental covariates for modeling a disease. Um, but the other data required is information on disease occurrence or the vector occurrence in the instance of vector-borne diseases. So I'm just going to flag some open um, sources here. I won't go into too much detail about them, but there's a site called GBIF, which um, has information on the occurrence of a range of different species globally. And this covers plants, um, insects, anything we could think of. Uh, so I'm just going to search for a common mosquito. Oh, and that's not shown again. Sorry. So I'm just going to search for a common mosquito here, Aedes aegypti. And then I can see on the map all the occurrence locations for that particular species. Again, this works for anything we're interested in. Oh, oh. If I knew what the Latin name for oak tree was, it would be a lot easier. But basically, you can search by common on um, nomenclature names to find um, occurrence records. Sorry. Then there's one which is specifically for vectors, um, and this is called vector base. Um, the data which goes into vector base is from genomic analysis, and where people collected samples and then done genetic sequencing. So you know that the ID on that species is, is correct and up to date. Um, GBIF is more citizen science data, so anyone could upload information to that about a species occurrence. And then with regards to infection, um, there's a site called Health Map, which does use nat natural language processing. So some of the, the methods which Joe discussed before to scrape data from Twitter, um, news sites, et cetera, on locations of infection. And similarly, there's, there's networks where people notify disease outbreaks and, and disease occurrence. So one called ProMed, for example, ProMed Mail. Um, one of the caveats with that is that it's not 
it's open data, but it's not collated into a database, so you have to do some processing and data extraction on that yourself to get the occurrence um, records. Whereas data from the other sources, so GBIF, Vectormed, and HealthMap, you can just go straight to the site and download the data as a CSV to use in your models. So, yep, yeah, just to go through this pipeline again, um, but in the context of a vector borne disease called chikungunya. Um, so, this is a mosquito borne disease which occurs in Africa and Asia and across Europe. Some of the symptoms include um, joint pain, fever, headaches, etc. There's no vaccine for this disease and there's no treatment if you have it. Um, so, it, it is a, a, a disease of public health importance. So to go through the pipeline, um, in this context, I leverage some existing estimates of mosquito distributions. Um, I trawled the literature and collated different sources of um, existing species distribution maps for Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti. Um, so for aegypti, I basically obtained seven different predictions and generated a weighted mean across them. Um, and for albopictus generated a weighted mean across nine different predictions here. So that's what you're seeing as the output. And so it gives some sort of consensus as to where this species would occur. Um, due to the nature of this research, we're mostly interested in East Africa where this disease is emerging. Um, so I'm going to focus on 13 countries in East Africa. Um, so to collate the, the disease occurrence data, um, I basically did a literature troll, um, extracted data from publications, WHO reports, and the ProMed Mail. Um, one of the downsides of HealthMap, that, that site which uses na natural language processing to extract the data, is some of the, the issues arising to the geographic location, which um, Joe picked up on before. You do have some of those issues with the for published data, um, they might just say, you know, there was 20 cases within this locality. And that's why we see these polygons here on the map. Um, so each of these represent an area, so a kind of region where we know that there was a disease incidence, incidence but the exact location within that polygon is unknown. And um, so I can account for that in my model by basically bootstrapping within that site and generating different submodels. So for, for chikungunya here, I'm using a total of about 150 data points. And then some of the environmental covariates that I chose to include in the model um, were population density. So that was obtained from WorldPOP through Google Earth Engine. Um, land surface temperature, so daytime, just generated as I showed you very quickly using Google Earth Engine again. Um, NDVI, so Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which is just a, a measure of greenness, so how much vegetation is in an area. So that will affect um, suitability for the mosquito. Likewise with precipitation, and then evapotranspiration, so how much water retains um, in the location. So these covariates went into the model. Um, I fitted a boosted regression tree model in R, generated 100 submodels, and I just chose the the polygons, which had fewer than 100 gridded cells or pixels within them, was that I knew that the exact site of occurrence for the disease was included in at least one of my submodels. So I generate 100 predictions across East Africa, and then I combine them all and generate a mean um, to look at kind of variation and confidence of the model. Um, and then evaluation and statistics is is one country area under the curve, um, which ranges from zero being kind of a very low prediction power to one, which is kind of implicit of overfitting. Um, and then another factor called a Briar score, which ranges from zero to one, but it's the inverse here. Zero is really, really high accuracy um, of predictive power of the model. So this is what I get as an output from combining each of these 100 different surfaces. Um, so the model that I fitted here is at a one kilometer by one kilometer resolution. So the, the satellite imagery and the predictions will in, infer a risk within a one kilometer by one kilometer area. 
Um, so there are some downsides of that. I might know within that kilometre or predict within that kilometre that there is a risk of disease, but there's going to be hot spots and heterogeneity within that one kilometre area. Um, but because I generated these 100 predictions, each fit to different bootstraps of the data, I can look at kind of probability that a, um, a value exceeds a certain risk threshold. Um, and that can be a little bit more informative. So how many times does a pixel come out at being high risk across all of my 100 submodels? And that's what this um, prediction is on the right. And it, Kind of the purpose of these models is to make inferences about locations where you don't have any data or where you know kind of risk is unknown. Um, so on the left here is the data that's gone into my model, and on the right is the spatial prediction. And we can see some areas that so Uganda as a whole is coming up as you know kind of high risk or highly suitable for chikungunya, but I have no data that's gone into the model. So that can as a step you know, kind of inform that we need to do surveillance in that area, um, either to confirm or reject that the disease is, is within or suitable for that um, locality. Or it could be used to inform surveillance, so we know from an ecological point of view that Uganda is suitable for chikungunya. Currently we might not have any cases detected, but we might want to monitor that over time. So these outputs are, are useful from a public health perspective in kind of tailoring where surveillance might occur, um, where disease prevention and control can occur as well. So that was just one use case for chikungunya. Um, as part of my postdoc with Jen, we are going to be mapping mostly Rift Valley fever virus in Tanzania. So similar approaches, but we'll be using um, model-based geostatistics, which account for spatial correlation. Um, we'll be mapping at a a much higher spatial resolution as well because we'll just be focusing on one country. Um, but this is a kind of demonstration of the pipeline of what you can do leveraging all open data. So, you know, kind of all of this was collected from existing open access publications or from open source remotely sensed data. Um, yeah, so just some acknowledgements here. The work's funded by NERC. Um, with collaborators in Tanzania and um, Glasgow. And then just to generate those vector suitability surfaces, although they were from open access publications, the outputs weren't provided, so I had to contact the authors directly to obtain those. Um, so just an acknowledgement here that um, you know some of the authors have provided those outputs to be used. And then, um, yeah, my apologies on behalf of Jen um, being unable to be here today. But yeah, she's kind of pioneered and, and led the focus of this work being in East Africa and on emerging infections. Yep, so that's all I've got, um, but happy to take questions when we do the panel. I'm sorry for overrunning a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will ask that if you have questions for John, um, just save them until after our next speaker's talk, and then we'll do like, a panel style discussion. So now let me introduce uh, Professor Danny Arribas Bell. So Danny is Professor in Geographic Data Science at the uh, University of Liverpool, uh, and also Deputy Program Director for Urban Analytics at the Alan Turing Institute, where he's also an ESRC Fellow. And Danny's research combines modern computation with new forms of data to shed light on the spatial structure of cities. Cool. Danny's going to tell us about being open by default. All right. So thanks, thanks very much for the for the invite, and thanks for showing up today. Um, I'm not going to say much more about me. I think it's it's as the previous speaker said, it's said better than I would have. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'm going to warn you a little bit that. I'm going to warn you. No, I'm, not, I'm going to warn you fully that it's going to be a bit of a little bit of a, a shift of gears in what I'm going to talk about, or at least I'm going to abstract away. And sadly, there's no code uh, that's going to be shown on my slides. And what I'm going to try to um, convey to you in the next, hopefully, 20 minutes, is some of the ideas behind trying to be this this notion of open by default. What do we mean by by open? 
you know, there's a lot of talk of open, and, and depending on which venues you go, there's there's more talk than than walk, and and there's others where there's actually both. So, um, I, I'll give you at least you know this is my two cents. So, uh, make of it what you will, um, and I'll illustrate it with uh, a current project that I, we're working on. And I should have said this is doing work with Martin Fleischmann, uh, who's also at the lab and and the researcher at the Turing project. Oh, and. If you want to get the talk slides, I'm trying to, to walk the talk, so this is also openly available. You can scan the, the QR code or go to urbangrammarai.xyz, and it's all, it's all there. And I'll, I'll show you that URL later. So they said you have open research. I think, or at least I wanted to start the talk, getting everyone to think a little bit what we mean by open. I think sometimes, and Definitely, if you've been around long enough, you realize that there are some terms that start as really meaningful, and at some point, they get almost cannibalized by people who who have very different ideas, and at some point, they end up meaning either they end up meaning everything, which is to say, they end up meaning very, very little. So, um, you know, th there's really a lot of ways of of understanding what open means. There's the the you open as in a verb, you should open things, let's open up. Uh, there's the question, is, is this really open? Uh, or is it open? Or it's kind of open? Or it's actually open? And the truth is, that, I mean, I don't have a, a, a core definition. I actually kind of do on the next slide, but that is my opinion, I, I should say. That I don't think there is a common consensus on what it is. But I think it, it warrants a bit of a a critical eye when you're approaching products or when you're approaching analysis and when you're approaching projects that claim to be fully open. You know, it might be open, but one of the one of the five in, in the slides, right? And I think it's important because depending on which of those five, what we can actually do with, with the openness, what we can get out of the, the project is, is very different. So to me, and this is uh, full disclaimer, this is entirely my, my opinion, so there's no science here, this is entirely my views. Um, open is about making research transparent, so you can see not only what's at the very end, but how we've got to that very end. It's accessible, so you can take that very end, build on that, as Josh was saying with some of the examples in his work, uh, and it's transferable, which is to say, if I see someone else's project and I would like to, to do it, I should be able to know what I need to do to, to re reproduce is a, another big word, but um, whether reproduce, replicate, or at least being able to run it uh, on your own, um, it needs to be transferable. So the, the old saying, it runs on my laptop, what's the problem? That's, that's just not very open, right? And then to be a, bit, a, a little controversial with the, you know, so you can come all at me and and tell me how wrong I am later in the questions, but at least to wake us all up a bit of a um, into the in controversial land, I actually think open data is not necessary, nor is it sufficient for for research to be to be open. I think it's great, and I think if you have the choice, you should. But if we get into this mentality where open research needs open data and if there's no open data what's the point then i think we're missing a lot of the points that make open research really valuable and that has to do with the process which is what i'll talk about in a second so this project that i'm going to talk about today with um martin fleischmann uh, we we named it or from the very very beginning we decided to uh, take this approach that we well we I mean, I'm sure someone else invented it before us, but we're loosely calling open by default. Uh, and the, the core of it is that, like happiness, this is really openness is about the journey, is much more, much more than than the destination. Which is to say, what what's really valuable in open research is making the process of research open, making every step as as accessible to to everyone who wants to access it as possible, rather than just the very end of 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 the research. Uh, to do that, and maybe not every research project needs to or, or should do this, but in the kind of computational research that, that we're doing, uh, we found that treating research as 
uh, or research artifacts, and this you know, research artifact is a kind of fancy word, but it's, it's a useful one because it can be anything. It can be a talk, it can be a paper, it can be uh, the code that you use for an analysis, it can be a dashboard or a report that you write. All of these are research artifacts. Some of them are outputs, some of them are not outputs necessarily. We found it really useful to treat each of these bits, each of these building blocks as open source software from day one, rather than treating them as, as something that lives on my laptop and on Martin's laptop for most of the project, and then at the very end, we, can, we make it open, we put it up on GitHub or, or any other portal. And the other motto that we've, or the other ethos that we've adopted very, very strongly in the project is this idea of, of, of course, using open source software, but when possible, and, and it's more often than you would realize, also feeding back and nurturing existing open source infrastructure. And, and the idea here is that if there's a wheel that Right, you know, that rolls very well, you should not make another one because it's duplicating work is wasting time. And there, there's a really you know, clear incentive and clear temptation when you're running a research project to, you wouldn't see necessarily as reinventing the wheel, but there is a real uh, temptation to, to start things from scratch because it may give the impression that the project is generating more. In fact, is probably generating less because you're spending more time on things that already exist. So let me give you an example. This is all the theory that I wanted to cover today or all the ideas that I wanted to discuss. From now on, I'm going to show you, I'm going to walk the talk a little bit on how we've done or how we've embodied these ideas on an actual project. The project is called the, the Urban Grammar uh, and it's um, based half at Liverpool, half at at the Alan Turing Institute in, in London. And at the core, I mean, this is a three-year project that takes a good chunk of my time and all of Martin's time. But at the, so there's a lot of things that sort of spin around it. But at the core of, of the project really is developing a characterization of space or, or a geographic typology that's based on form and function and that's designed to understand urban environments or, or cities. So uh, if you, um, you know, the keen eye on the previous talk where Josh was showing some of the um, examples that you can get from Earth Engine. There was a couple that were land use classifications. Uh, there's a lot of land use classifications. You can think of this as another land use classification that somehow inverts um, the focus. Most land use classifications focus on land, which if you've looked at a map of the Earth is not a city. Uh, this land use classification focuses on where most people live, which is about 3-4% of the land. So we, we put the focus on, on urban areas and we develop a lot more granularity for uh, cities than we do for, for most of the, the rest of the land. And for the purposes of what I will be talking about later, it's also important to know, or at least keep in mind, I'm not going to get into more details, but it's important to keep in mind that there's a pretty substantial component on this project on leveraging satellite imagery, some of the ideas that the previous talk was, um, was discussing. And a lot of that leverage will happen through uh, machine learning models or artificial intelligence, as we call it today, or these days. So if you think in terms of, or if you're trying to think of how to approach a project like this one from an open perspective, how would you go about being open by default, or what does it mean for the urban grammar to be open by default? This took me a while to conceptualize, and I ended up coming to these, these two, two distinctions. There's what I call the kitchen, which is all the stuff that we use in the project, all the, the process of doing research, all the steps that usually, when you look at the, the published paper, you would never see. This involves collecting data, and in our case, it's collecting a lot of data, because we need satellite imagery, we need, um, I'm not, we need data or geographic data from a lot of sources. At the end of the day, we end up collecting about 300 different variables from over 50 sources. So there's a lot of data involved. Bringing this data together is not necessarily, it's a little bit like one of the, or the, the two talks before said, it's not only kind of downloading a file and, and you're good to go. Um, there's a lot of processing that I hate the word cleaning because it's not cleaning, it's modeling and, and there's a lot of uh, transformations that are non-trivial or, or 
or non-deterministic that are involved. And, and that involves also developing new methods, new techniques, and it also involves writing a lot of code. Some of that very bespoke to the, to the work that we're doing, some of that probably more generalizable. And all of this needs to run on an infrastructure, which is to say it needs to run on, on computers. Now, which computers that, that may be more flexible? And I think in 2022, you know, you, you should be writing code that can run in your laptop or it can run on your supercomputer, ideally with minimal change. So all of that falls within what I call infrastructure. So this is half of what, how I think the project should be open. I'm going to show you along those lines how we're thinking of, of, of what being open means. And, and you can think of this, as I said, as the, this is the, the kitchen where the research happens. And then there's the sausage, right? That this is the stuff that we make and that we try to sell to the world in the form of papers, in the form of talks, in the form of data products. And that involves a series of activities that you're probably familiar with in some ways. Uh, there's dissemination, so academic dissemination, going to, to academic conferences and to journal articles, but also more less academic dissemination coming to um, or engaging the general public, engaging stakeholders, engaging spatial planners, etc. As part of all this process, we're not only generating articles, we're generating other stuff. One of them, for example, is this notion of open data products. So, like Josh was talking in the, I'm realizing it's really good that the order was as it was, because half my talk is, is a lot easier to understand thanks to the previous one. So, what, sometimes the, the output of the research is is more data. You, you end up taking data, but the output, the, the endpoint is generating more data that then other people can use to build on that and, and do more cool stuff. So we call that open data products, and that of course involves uh, a, a file, a CSV or, or a JSON or whatever you, you use, but it also involves another, a whole set of infrastructure around it that allows people to access it, to download it, to explore it without having to, to download it, etc. And then there's a lot of journaling and reporting. Reporting because this project is funded by public money, so at the end of the day, I have to go back to ESRC and convince them that the money they've spent on, on us, it was, it was well spent. Um, but also for the general, or the broader community, I should say, of people who are interested in the project and in the outputs, it's good to keep a log of what you're doing. And, and that community might be, in many cases, just Martin and, Martin and I future selves, when we want to look back at what the project did, and in other cases, maybe a bit, a bit wider. So let me um, jump in with a couple of examples on how we're, uh, how, we're, how we're conceptualizing this idea of making the kitchen open or, or making the process of research open. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of data. A lot of the data that we need, we collect it, and then we have to transform it in ways that we can bring it together. Some of the data are, uh, come from satellites, so they would be a uniform grids. Some of them come from things like the Ordnance Survey, so they might come in, in administrative boundaries. Some of them come on zip code, well, postcode boundaries, which, well, there's no boundaries, so come at the postcode level, which is a, a headache of its own uh, right. And at the end of it, we need to bring everything into, into the same spatial unit. So I'm not going to go one by one how we've done these, because it's probably not the best use, definitely, of your time to listen to. Uh, but here are a couple of principles that we've learned after, you know, a little over two years of dealing with these. The first one is that standard formats are better than niche. And again, this sounds very, very obvious, but the temptation to come up with something that you've created and that does exactly what you want is just too high to ignore sometimes. And when that comes, you should just put it aside, ignore it, and put it on a CSV or whatever standard format you, you have because every time that you create something niche, you're making it harder for other people to access, for other people to understand. And that other people, by the way, might be yourselves next year, might yourselves in, in five years' time. So unless you have an extremely good reason, you should never create your own file format. Because it's also a bit of a, I've realized that it's also a bit of a sort of intellectual arrogance, is, is kind of thinking that you know better than everyone else who's done the things that you're doing before you. And, and the truth is that in most cases you don't, you don't need it. Um, the second, when it comes to, to formats, and this again, uh, I'm probably preaching to the right choir here, but open formats are better than proprietary because they're easier to maintain. They usually have better community support, which means that when a company goes bust or decides to 
abandon its maintain maintenance, you can still use it. And, and if you want to look back five years time, 10 years time, what, what this project was doing, or, or five months time for that matter, um, you might find yourself stuck with not being able to open Word file 98 or you know whatever it is the proprietary formats that you're that you're going and this and the final one is also an extremely opinionated so this might make some of you cringe if you're big database fans and I don't think this applies to everything in the world uh, but it certainly does to a project like this one we found that static file formats or static storage of, of data works a lot better than, than dynamic data or server-based databases of things like SQL or Postgres and, and so on. And, and the reason is that traditional databases are fantastic for a lot of use cases. None of those is the kind of that we have, where we basically have a, a big box where we dump our data. And once we dumped it, we very rarely update it. What we want is to access it uh, from potentially different computers, but access it in, in ways that uh, that we can read entirely for, for analysis. So I mentioned that some of the stuff that we, we have to do to get to the point where we have that classification of, of urban form and function that I was talking about this project's about, some of the things that we need to do don't exist. Some of the techniques don't necessarily exist. And some of the models do exist, but they, there's not um, ready to use tools. In those cases, and only in those, we've decided to um, to create our own new packages, in well, or to create abstracted code that, or repurposable code, uh, code that is not specific for our project, but that can be then accessed by other people and used in in other contexts. And we've done this actually following two models. One is we have created actually a couple of packages that that have been born out of the project. But uh, where possible, and, and actually in most cases, a lot of the general code that we've created has not gone into a new package, has gone into an existing package that we might, we might have not been running, but that was an open source project. And we found that that makes that package a lot better, and it also makes it easier for us to maintain it because effectively it's part of a code base that is maintained by a community. And that community might include ourselves, but you know, at some point I'm, I'm getting very, very busy these days answering emails. So I, and doing other parts of my job, that maintaining code is less, is something that I can afford less, and we find that contributing to a bigger community that is uh, able to, to maintain it is, is a really useful strategy to make your code useful and usable in the long term. So it makes it a lot more sustainable. And then I said there's a lot of bespoke code uh, that, that really you know, it's not that we don't want other people to use, it's that we don't think it will be necessarily useful because it's about creating the figures in our papers or it's about creating the, the data sets that we're interested in. In those cases, we rely heavily on computational notebooks and Jupyter notebooks, and we put everything online, but it's not contributed back to a package because it's not clear how it would be, be able. So what we use is a project called Jupyter Book that generates very uh, easy to read and to access web pages um, that contain all the code. And, and in this case, the, the goal is not really to, to have others running our code, it's to have others being able to very quickly explore and study the, the code that we've used in case for any reason it would be useful to learn or to repurpose in their own case. But it's code that we think it's, it's going to be too bespoke to make it part of, of other packages. So it is open, it is accessible, but it's through a different medium. Then the final bit on, on the kitchen, the part about infrastructure, and again, this is also very, very, I have very opinionated views on how infrastructure should be run in, in 2022. Uh, how many of you have heard of containers, Docker containers? And how many of you use Docker containers regularly? So great, you should continue, and if you haven't raised your hand, you should check it out. Uh, not everyone, I will say not everyone agrees with me. So. Again, make of it what you will. But I think they're a fantastic way for encapsulating a stack that, that's required for running a specific code base. And in our case, it was, it was really well fitted because Martin had his own laptop, I had my own laptop, and then we had at least a couple of servers where we were running some of the analysis. And being able to say, this code that I checked in runs not only on my laptop, but runs on the container, which we understand what, how it's built 
and that we can also then make running a bigger computer with very, very minimal intervention is, it will save you a lot of time. Okay, so that, that's a, what we call the kitchen, the process of doing research, how we've made the, the magic happen. Now, what do we do with the magic? How do we sell the, the sausage, so to speak? So I talked about dissemination being academics. We our currency, our academic articles. So we write papers, we present them, and then eventually we want to get them published. Everything in our, in our project is managed on GitHub. So we've started writing, and, and I say managed, not stored, which is to say we started writing the papers on GitHub from day one, which is slightly different than writing it on Dropbox and then once it's ready to go, putting it on, on GitHub. Um, why is it different? Because the whole point of version control is that you can control different versions. So here you control versions since there's a blank page until there is a pay, there's a paper that, that's readable. Now, and I will say this is, remember the title of the talk was open by default. It doesn't mean always open or 100% open all the time, right? And in fact, with papers, for example, is a good example where I think it doesn't always have to be open. So the, the repos started private. We wrote the papers private. We tracked con version control. We did all the revision for the journal on private. And once the paper is accepted, then we, we flick the, the repo open and, and it's accessible and people can access the whole history. But once it's, it's, um, it's accepted and am I proud of this? I don't know, but what I what I know for sure is that the, you know you got to play the game that you're in, and you don't always get to get to choose the game. So the game now is that you do need to get papers published. So the the common ground or the mid middle ground that we uh, found is we'll write the paper in private, um, and then once it's ready, we'll, we'll or once it's accepted, we'll we'll push it out. Uh, we also do a lot of talks like this one uh, and others at conferences and other events. All the talks for this project are um, online. So there's a page, Urban Grammar AI Direct XYZ, forward slash talks. There's a list there of all the talks that we've given for the project, links to the slides, and where possible links to the YouTube or, or recording where, where we did it. That was one of the, the very few things that the pandemic made better, probably. Um, and also the slides themselves, they're in an open format. They're HTML files. So you know, everyone can, well, for one, you can load them up on a browser, which is probably the most popular platform globally. Um, but they're also code, effectively. Remember what I said, that we treat it as an open source software artifact, and in many ways, it is. So talks are open, so you can access them, but also the backend is, is available. And these, the talks have been open from, from day one. We don't, we didn't keep private any of the other repos. Uh, and then I said that we have to do a lot of journaling and, and reporting. So it's 2022 and we decided that blogging is cool again. And this was before Elon Musk announced that he wanted to buy Twitter. So we, we, we had a, a whole blog where we've had, where we've been journaling every uh, activity that, that, we, that we did. And this was extremely useful for us, at least for two things. One, for days when we thought that we were not making any progress on the project and we hadn't done anything. It kind of gives you a warm feeling to go to the website and see that there's a list of things that the project's already done. Um, but also because every year I have to fill in a very obscure and boring form to report back to UKRI on how we've been spending their, their money. And that's usually a pretty dreadful day in the year. With this, is slightly less dreadful because it's basically translating what we've been publishing into their, their online portal. And again, it's a blog that you can access, so all you need is a connected browser. But if you're interested in how we're running on the back end, it's all, it's all static. Remember, it's, there's no server. I mean, there's this file server, but it's all a statically generated page. So if you're going to download it and open it on your laptop, online or offline, it's all, it's all good because it's just a, a bunch of HTML files. Uh, I said that one of the outputs that we generate are uh, data products. So there is data involved. Um, so we, we create data sets. In, in our case, we create this classification. And we put out the data set so other people can download it and do whatever they want with it. But we recognize that maybe not everyone is as, as nerd as we are and as excited as shape files and your packages as we are. So if you still want to interact with the project, we also have other, other mediums. So we have 
an interactive map that you can uh, access on Urban Grammar AI or XYZ forward slash great dash Britain and you can play with, with the map and with the data that we've generated basically with a connected browser and you can uh, open this up on your phone as well. And same as with almost everything, it's an interactive map. It's really also just a bunch of, a really large bunch of, of static small files that are sitting on a GitHub repo that are pulled together through, the, through a tiny bit of JavaScript. So if you want to clone it and, and create your own, or and we have a blog post actually on the pipeline on, on how we built a fully interactive state-of-the-art uh, web map hosted on GitHub pages effectively. Okay, so wrapping up, because I'm probably running out of time, if I've not run out already. Uh, the three things that I would like you to walk out this room from, from my talk would be this one. If you're, if you're serious about doing open research, and I think you should be, uh, this idea of, from this ethos from the open source community, the idea of release early and release often is really what you should, what you should go by. Uh, if the more you wait to start making it open, the more of a pain it is, the more of a chore it is, and also the less benefits it, it contains. And at the same time, you, you can also flip it and say, really, making it open, it's a f it should be a feature, it's not a, it's not a bug, it's not a chore. It should be something that makes your project in the long run better, that makes it more reachable by other people, more accessible, transparent, and transferable. And also, you will find that there's a lot of uh, spillovers on, on these benefits. The idea that whenever you want to check a data, a data set that you created, you don't have to go to the folder and remember whether it was version A, B, or C, or A final, or C final final. You can just go to the public repository where you posted it and, and access it like anyone else would, is, is uh, sort of a, a nice peace of mind. And then I'll, I'll just find the spirit of finding inspiration or ending inspirationally uh, with the quote of the Dalai Lama, which I think it, it, it uh, fits quite well here. Uh, this idea that when you're making something open, you're, you're losing something, you're losing an edge, you're losing an advantage over the rest of, of, the, of the world. I think it's, it's almost the other way around. I think when you share, you're multiplying the, the benefits and the effects that the, the work that you do has. And with that, I think I'm going to do it. There's a couple of things if you want to read on these ideas that I'll let you check online. Um, but other than that, I'm going to leave it there. There's a lot of uh, principles for us to think about there. Thanks, Danny. So uh, now we'll take about, um, about 15 minutes to have some questions for our speakers. So I'll pull some more chairs. We'll have our speakers. Turn it over. Yep. Thank you. So, uh, I mean, I might just start with a question of my own because um, I mean Josh you showed there there are so many different layers of satellite data available so if you were starting a new project what kind of principles and guidelines do you use to actually find and choose the right data for you right because there must be a ton of different data sets that could all essentially do the same thing yeah that's a I don't know this is working. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Oh, cool. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I think it depends on the requirements of the project. Like, you know, kind of, there are a lot of different sources, but there are different nuances amongst them. So, you know, kind of how frequently that data is collected, the spatial resolution, what what bands are being collected as well. Um, you know, there's, there's a range of different sources which just focus on different geographic locations. So European Space Agency mostly do stuff in Europe. We do have some global um, global work. USGS mostly again in the states. Um, yeah, different different factors like that probably contribute as to what what sources you're going to use. Um, for us, it's mostly the spatial resolution um, because what we do. That the idea behind what we do is we want our outputs to be useful, we want them to help to inform policy, 
And if we're generating estimates at quite a coarse spatial resolution, we don't see much knowledge gained from that versus, you know, kind of some, some of these summary statistics which already exist at an administrative level, for example. Um, yeah, so stuff I was doing for my PhD was like three metre by three metre resolution, so very, very high spatial resolution. The stuff I've described today is one kilometre by one kilometre. So yeah, mostly kind of spatial needs really and what you see those outputs informing afterwards. Have you got any, anything to add to that, Danny? Um, I mean, I think it's it's a problem, but it's a good one to have, right? I think it's... it's, it's or it shows that we've got to a point where we're choosing our data by the needs that we have rather than by the uh, offerings that, that we're given. And if anything, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a problem, but it's a good one to have. And I think how to choose it, it allows us to kind of take a step back and, and think what, what would be, in an ideal world, what would be the data that I, that I should be using for this project? And, and then we can choose what's closest. And, in some cases, might be very, very close. Um, I do think there is a, an issue of discoverability, and, and things like Earth Engine and other um, solutions are, you know, are making steps towards that. But we're moving into a world where the problem is not that we only have one data that that we have to use for everything, but that we have way more data than we can probably discover. And the problem is how do we uh, identify or how do we know that the the one that we really want to use does exist? Five, ten years ago, right? Um, I'm going to open up to the audience. Uh, do we have any questions for our speakers? Yes. Um, I can do. Yeah, I might as well. Yeah, we're all getting used to. Um, so this is a question for Danny. You, you talked about data uh, towards the end. Uh, how do you manage the version control of data itself? Do you mean the data that we release? Yes, uh, the data products that you release. How do you, where do you put them and, and how do you keep track of things because you are um, going back and fixing things, right? So we, we don't version control. We don't version control it like we do code because it doesn't change as often. Um, once once we get a, a, the data product, is that's the whole point that it, you know, that's the end point, that's what we want people to be using and pointing to. Um, but we do have versions, and the same places where we publish the data, uh, we have it on a, um, well, the data sits on Fixture and then is distributed through something called the Consumer Data Research Center. Both allow for uh, versions, so you could say this is version 1.0 of the space of signatures for Great Britain, and it links to this code or it links to this paper, and if we ever publish a new version, we could have version 1.1 or 2.0, but we don't, explicitly for, uh, version track it because it doesn't change as often as code. So um, there are op options and there are projects that that are focusing on trying to version control databases that change a lot more often. Um, but there, w we find there a bit of overkill for what we what we want to do. Uh, there are other projects where they are very very um, useful for. Don't know, Josh. Yeah, um, ours, our version control is more in-house, it's not as open, um, so we just publish and make open the final final product that we want to disseminate. Um, I think that's somewhere we can learn and grow. Um, I think there are benefits of being transparent about, you know, kind of versions and version histories. And like you said, making the whole process transparent. Um, likewise with our code, we, we have private repos which we make public once we publish for our benefits of it being open from the start. Um, yeah, good question. Um, definitely something we need to do within LSTM as a group, you know, kind of to explore and, and manage and document that a little bit better. Great, thanks. Oh yeah, sure. Is it GitHub for data? There are some attempts uh, I can't remember what it. There's a couple of data versioning portals. I can't remember their 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 name now. Uh, they've they've also been way more than they they are <laughs> available now because they tend to go 
past. I think maybe finding a business model is not as clear. But th there are examples or there are efforts. And on the software side, there is software that tries to sort of augment or tweak it or things like it for for making it more efficient for data. Um, but I haven't played too much with it. Q Q Q Sorry. QZ or there, there's a couple of projects. I think if you if you Google data version and version control, you would probably come up with with a few. Well, I just recently started here in Liverpool, but before that, uh, I was in Reading uh, as a data manager. And what we will do is we'll use GitHub and just do releases on Zenodo, or which it will even give you a DOI. So you can give that to people, and then we'll be able to reproduce re your research using the exact version of the data that you use for the publication itself. So I don't know if that helps. And I know that there's a GitHub large data thing. I, I don't, don't know the exact name, because GitHub has some limitations, at least the free version that I use, because I don't want to pay for it. Um, so there's some limitations about the size of the data itself. So if you have something that it's very, very large, you might want to look into an alternative. But uh, there are services like Zenodo that I said that I mentioned, which they will give you like a DUI link into a snapshot of the data. So basically creating a version of your data set. And then you can release new versions of it. And then uh, whenever anyone goes and uses that DUI and there's a new version, it will tell you uh, there's a newer version published on do you want to use that one, or you want to use the old version? So I think that might help. Oops. Yeah, I, th I think there's, there's there's a couple of those kind of similar things to Zenodo, like Dryad, and, and I think Figshare was kind of competing to be one of those big data storage places for research purposes as well. But I don't I don't know how they compare for how easy they are to search. So it's probably worth worth a check. Um, do we have any other questions for either of our speakers? Yes, over there, I'm going to bring it over. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks both, that was really interesting. I, I had a question, it's sort of related to Josh's talk more, but I think it's probably a general data management issue. Um, so with, your, um, with, with the Google Earth engine, obviously there's a huge amount of information that you can get from different layers and so on. So one thing that was, you know, you know so you got, there's obviously atmospheric data that could interfere with some of the other data sets. Obviously, if you can't, you know, you can't see through clouds. So is there anything on these databases or should there be anything on these databases to give you an indication as to how reliable that stuff is? Because you obviously, if you're collecting, say, large spatial data, you can't check every single pixel or anything like that to see if it's been covered by cloud and that sort of thing. So is there anything, because I know that like, with genetic stuff, you can sometimes get uh, phenotype um, improves the likelihood of your heritability from your genotype sort of things. So is there anything like that for these, these uh, spatial data sets? Yeah, again, I think that's a real good question. Um, what I was showing with Google Earth Engine there was kind of some of the pre-processed data that they produce. So that land surface temperature surface is something that they calculated using the raw satellite imagery. Um, they'll have a range of different processes within that. They'll do some cloud masking, so remove pixels where there is a certain percentage of cloud cover. So some of that radiance um, reflectance values that the sensor collects could be inflated or you know non-accurate due to cloud cover, for example. Um, the algorithms that they use to generate those process surface, um, surfaces there are kind of like you know methods based papers which demonstrate the validity and how some of those outputs compare um to say ground truth um meteorological stations which might collect data for example so i think it is a very good question if i was dealing with the raw data myself so i was just bring, bringing in the raw banded in imagery doing that calculation within google earth I think there would be some concerns there in that, you know, I I could have just plucked an algorithm to generate LST from another source without doing any sort of validation myself. I think you've got to have a little bit of trust um, in some of the methodologies used here. Um, I'm not overly transparent 
in that I'm, I've trusted this Google Earth imagery and the LST, but I haven't then said the, the conversion mechanism used is this particular approach um, and listed, you know, kind of some of the caveats with that or the assumptions. Again, I think maybe that's a gap which should be filled a little bit more with my own reporting and what I'm doing. Um, I don't know if Danny's got anything to add to that. I mean, a lot of this is, we call them data, but it's model data. A lot of it, uh, there is an element of observation, but the observation is reflection of light when whatever sensor hit throws a photon or whatever. And what you really get is a measure of temperature or something. And in between, you know, that the kitchen is not always very clear. I think in in some cases it, it is a bit more, but, and, you know, you just have to, as a bit like Josh was saying, half trust, half do your due diligence that the data that you're using, for example, the one on Earth Engine, you would imagine there's a large community around it that work with it, validate, and this, there was something blatantly wrong it would be fed back and, and it would be filled. Uh, cl I mean, cloud cover is an unsolved problem, as far as I can tell in terms of remote sensing. There's there's ways of trying to get at it, but I've worked a little bit with something called Sentinel-2, which is the optical one of the, the European Space Agency, and they give you a cloud mask, but you know, even then, sometimes they say that there's snow in August in London, and when you look at it, it's very clearly not snow. It's uh, it's a cloud or, or something so it's it's imperfect and it's it can't from the fact that it's modeled but you just have to do your due diligence as much as you you think that convinces you that what what you need it for is is good but uh, you need you do need to be aware that these are not mathematical recordings this there is a mathematical recording but then there's a lot of things that happen afterwards up to the point where you, you consume the data. Um, so the best example I can probably think of is with the temperature data. So when you were doing that example, you were just kind of averaging over the year, but obviously, you know, varies quite a lot throughout the year. How, I mean, obviously, you could just kind of go in and run it, you know, January to January, February to February, start to end sort of thing. But are there quicker ways of coding that kind of like, you know, generating multiple outputs instead of just having to do it manually one by one? Or do you kind of have to just go through that each time with Google, Google Earth Engine? What's the... <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's ways to loop through, generate, you know, kind of monthly averages. There's existing data sets as well, which have already generated that for us. I think kind of one of the limitations of the work I described here is that I'm looking at just spatial variation, not temporal variation, and that's just due to the amount of data that's out there. Um, if the occurrence data that I had was temporally granular and sufficient that I could model, you know, kind of seasonal changes, then yeah, I would want to look at maybe factoring in how those covariates change over time as well. Um, I guess, yeah, it's quite a crude metric, just taking a mean or a median across the year. Um, what I could do is like some sort of sensitivity analysis where I include, you know, covariates from different seasons and see how that affects the risk outputs. But yeah, good point. And we'll go to the corner there. Yeah, there's another question. Um, great talks from you both. Um, I just wondered, so I'm a sort of clinical genomics data person, not really anything to do with environment. How do you keep, how would you recommend or have you done um, open data with clinical data that's obviously sensitive and can't be released before a certain time point? How would you account for that? Yeah, it's a very good point about clinical data and kind of identifying features within that. And obviously, geographic, geospatial attributes is a, a massive identifiable feature. Um, some of the data sets I've used in the past um, have just been spatially kind of jittered so that the true, true site is, you know, displaced by between 5 and 10 kilometres, for example. Um, 
that's one way of kind of getting around that. Um, but yeah, you kind of have to have really good data management, data sharing principles in place as to what you can and can't do with, with sharing sensitive information like that. Um, most of the clinical data that I've used has been collected by other programs, so USA, USA so the DHS program, for example, or UNICEF, and they do that anonymization and spatial jittering themselves. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, I, so I haven't worked with clinical data, um, but I do work sometimes with individual data, things like smartphone traces and so on. And I think that there's a big distinction depending on where the data comes from. If, if there is a data, um, what is it called, manager or the technical term, if there is someone who is in charge of doing that, then you can be a bit clearer. So if you're getting a lot of the data we, we got from for the Urban Grammar comes from the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, and specifically one of their jobs is making sure that the data that you have is is privacy respecting and that and that you couldn't easily at least i mean it's kind of impossible to do it entirely but that you couldn't de de anonymize it um when it doesn't i think it's with a bit of a mix of institutional context and then your ethical um sort of guidelines as a researcher. I think ideally you, you should really be bound by institutional guidance and, and infrastructure that says this is what you can do and what you can't. Uh, ironically, when you work with uh, industry data, that's not always the case. So it, it always ends up being, a, there's an element of being of your self-discretion of what you can do and, and can't. And I think that's something that we probably need to start thinking a bit more seriously. And in the same way that we, you know, we don't question now that people like you should learn to code, which we did question 10 years ago. Maybe now we should start, you know, not questioning that people like you should also learn a little bit of data disclosure, disclosure control, privacy, respect, respect, respecting practices, etc. And I think we're getting there, but it's not, it's not entirely there. Yeah, just to add on, um as the sensors in these satellites, you know, the performance increases, the spatial resolution increases, there are obviously concerns there about what spatial data is collected remotely, um, use of drones, for example. Um, you know, anyone could, well, previously anyone could fly a drone and collect spatial information. Um, there was no kind of monitoring of that, no regulation. I think we're getting better and people are becoming more aware that these are issues. Um, and as Danny was saying, maybe within the next five years or so, we might see more regulations coming into place as to how to deal with some of this, this sensitive data. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I might just ask one very brief last question, which is, let's say, if somebody is a beginner programmer and they haven't really engaged with open data before, are there any particular resources or places that are really good for learning these kind of principles and techniques that you could recommend? Yeah, I, I think it's maybe Edinburgh or Glasgow University, they have something called Our Coding Club, um, and they've got a range of online tutorials, you know, kind of introductions to coding, um, Python, R, introductions to natural language processing, modeling, spatial modeling, for example, open data itself. Um, I think they're a real good resource, yeah. Um, I think what I... <laughs> I was told once this thing, if you want to be a pirate, you should find a pirate ship, your pirate ship, rather than be a pirate on your own. And I think with this is a little bit the same. If you want to get better at coding and writing code and, and learn about open practices, you should find your own pirate ship, which, you know, this room might be, might be one. Because I don't think a lot of this stuff is codified or is stable enough that, I mean, there are materials and I think that that's one part of it, but a lot of this stuff is, is very much evolving and I think it's more important to have a community that you can rely on to learn together and to, to kind of throw around ideas than read the book, because I don't think it exists, at least today. Okay, great. Just, just, just to be transparent, we're not condoning software piracy there, right, Danny? No, no, no. no. <laughs> 
So um, now what we'll do, we'll have um, around about, I, I think, maybe like a 10, 15 minute refreshment break. We do have uh, free refreshment refreshments yeah yeah <laughs> we've got uh, donuts and coffee and a variety of drinks at the back um, and then maybe what we'll do is to figure out how we're going to work the practical we'll maybe go around during the uh, during the refreshment break and just see who's got a laptop and who would prefer to work in the PC suite but for now let's thank all our speakers once again